Hi, good afternoon. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kathy Weinman and I'm on the board and executive committee of the JCRC. JCRC works on behalf of the many Jewish organizations in our orbit. For me, JCRC's advocacy of Jewish values, including our stewardship of the earth for the, all of its inhabitants is especially meaningful. I'm thrilled we can have this conversation today with two people steeped in the work of building momentum to address climate change. But first I'd like to introduce my fellow board member, Samantha Joseph, who will be moderating today's conversation. Driven by a commitment to social justice Samantha is currently leading the vaccine equity and community outreach efforts at the Reggie Lewis mass vaccination site. Samantha f recently finished up her role as a senior advisor to the Jewish engagement team of the Biden for President campaign and has also led corporate environmental sustainability programs. Sam, your turn. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, as, as Kathy mentioned, I am very proud to be a board member of JCRC. And as the daughter of a rabbi, I learned about tikkun olam very early in life. And um, you know, it was really a foundational value. And so the opportunity to join the board of JCRC a couple of years ago, and to really be part of an organization that's giving a voice to some of the most vulnerable people in our community is, has been very meaningful. Um, since joining the board, I did have the honor of leading a trip to Israel for the Massachusetts Senate in 2016 and really got to see firsthand how much we can learn from the work that's being done in Israel, specifically on climate change, but on so many issues. So today we're here because JCRC is the convener of local and state officials on issues of importance to the Jewish community that impact us not only in Boston, but in Israel as well. And climate change, as we know, is, an, is a challenge that knows no borders and will require partnerships across government, academia, and the nonprofit sector to really address you know, such a challenging issue. So today we're gonna dive into that conversation with two people who have a deep understanding of building coalitions, particularly in the space of addressing climate change. So I'm very happy to be able to introduce Boston City Councilor Michelle Wu and Dr. Tarek Abu Hamid. Um, Councilor Wu is a mom, a daughter of immigrants, and a fierce believer that we can solve our deepest challenges through building community. As a Boston City Councilor, Michelle has worked in coalition to deliver bold systemic change and redefine what is possible through activist city leadership across our neighborhoods. And Dr. Abu Hamid from East Jerusalem, holds a bachelor's and a master's of science in chemical engineering from Ghazi University and a PhD in chemical engineering from Ankara University. In 2008, he established the Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Conservation at the Arava Institute and now serves as its director. 
You can find full bios on our website and we're going to drop, I think that link into our uh, chat function. And I also, I just want to open the conversations and we're going to give each of our speakers a chance to give a few remarks and then we'll get into some questions. And I want to remind everyone that you can use the Q&A function throughout the throughout their uh, remarks, and then we'll have a chance to uh, bring up some of those questions into the discussion later. So we'd like to start with Councillor Wu. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here um, on, as part of this program and um, to, to be sharing some of the work and the, the hopes <laughs> that, that I believe residents from all across our city are sharing when it comes to this very um, pressing issue uh, that both seems at once so large and so um, all encompassing and yet tangible across each one of our communities and, and facets of all our lives. So I had, I, I wanted to save more time for, for um, dialogue if possible. I had three points that I wanted to emphasize. One quickly on the urgency of climate change, two on how this is uh, something that cities and at the local level we can see tremendous action and progress on, and three uh, kind of what I believe is this, the secret to, to unlocking true action on all of this. So just a, a few words on how urgent this is, right? I, I know in some ways I'm um, saying this to a crowd of folks who have already chosen to be part of a conversation on this and, and may not need much explaining at, at, at all, um, but I will focus this on Boston in particular, right? We, we all know uh, the science, the international uh, reports that have come out about the very short window of time we have to take drastic action across our economy and society to keep warming below a certain temperature threshold after which the planet and all of our um, food systems and, and health systems will begin to face tremendous stress and, and threat. Um, and so we're, we're operating on that time scale that we need to stay below that threshold. We have about, you know, at this point, um, nine years left to get there. This has been a problem that we had uh, about a decade window or 12 year window before, and, and we haven't seen uh, as much action under the last administration in, in this country that we need to really, really ramp up over the next few years. But what does this mean for Boston? Boston, in fact, is one of the most vulnerable parts of the world when it comes to climate change. We were called out, um, you know, in the eastern coast of the United States as one of the six most vulnerable regions in the world. Um, we have already seen more days of uh, what are what's called sunny day flooding in Boston than any other coastal city in the United States, um, meaning that even in days without wind, without rain, without any storm at whatsoever, with sun in the sky, um, we are already seeing the water levels rising to the extent at which it's spilling over and, and causing flooding. I was just out on Morrissey Boulevard um, not too many months ago marking King Tide, which now happens several times a year, um, just under a, a beautiful day where the water levels uh, with the cycles of the moon mean that the, the flooding across a very uh, key road and, and set of emergency routes is completely blocked for, for in, in major segments. And this is, again, short of those instances that we need to be prepared for when there are storms, when there are nor'easters and, and other major weather incidents. The main ways in which the Boston area is experiencing a very rapid acceleration of climate change is around flooding, which we see tangibly in, 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 in um, the water levels, um, precipitation, heavier storms, more frequent storms, as well as heat. Uh, we are projected to see a tripling of the number of high heat days defined as 90 degrees or more um, throughout the year. So we will go from right now somewhere around, um, you know, less than a, a month's worth of 90 degree days per year to basically an entire summer where every single day will reach above 90 degrees, which is a tremendous shift for our climate, but also a tremendous shift when it comes to uh, what's possible for our workforce, how dangerous it makes outdoor work, how dangerous and um, how much of a health risk this poses for residents, particularly seniors, children, uh, those who, who have underlying med medical conditions. And so this is all happening in a faster and faster rate. And there's a, some historical context to this. Um, in addition to just the, the climate and the way that temperature interacts with our soil and, and um, reinforces the storm. But going back, uh, you know, now several hundred years in, in our city's history, we are a city that 
uh, much of the downtown area was built on landfill, right? Human made land. When Boston cut down so many of the hills in our city, dumped all of that soil into the water to fill in the back bay, right? Which used to actually be a bay. And so much of East Boston and downtown. And, and so all of this human made um, artificial land landfill is lower than um, natural land. And of course, that gives us just an even wider land mass that is vulnerable as, as the waters go up. And most of all, in terms of the urgency, we know that the burden of climate change is not shared equally or equitably. Uh, it is the very same communities that have borne the brunt of this pandemic, black, brown, immigrant communities, low-income areas um, that have contributed the least to climate change who are disproportionately represented in exposure to air pollution from, from greater and greater traffic, in the uh, likelihood of facing flooding but not being able to afford mitigation of exposure to high heat days. And so our environmental justice communities, uh, many, many communities and neighborhoods in Boston must be centered as we're thinking about this work. Uh, I will call out um, that the, some neighborhoods in particular, right, our social vulnerability index in Boston shows that Dorchester, East Boston, Hyde Park, Mattapan, Mission Hill, and Roxbury are the neighborhoods at particular risk. Um, and this is where climate risk layers on top of lack of transit access, layers on top of lack of food access. Um, and so the ways in which our communities are structured must be seen through a lens of equity in climate justice as racial and economic justice. The second point I wanna make is uh, just how much city leadership matters in this area. Of course, I am relieved and, and excited to see momentum and to, to continue pushing for the United States uh, to return to a, a role where we are uh, even acknowledging uh, the science of climate change and doing something about it. But in addition to pushing momentum for the federal Green New Deal, uh, we have a roadmap at the local level, at the city level, for exactly how cities uniquely can contribute. Whereas the federal Green New Deal lays a, a ambitious and necessary connections between uh, labor and resilience and infrastructure, at the local level, we can combine the ways in which cities can regulate buildings and development, the, the built environment, transportation and housing, uh, food access, even in connection with our schools and small businesses, there are ways for city government and our actions um, as the regulator, as a purchaser in the market, you know, a, a procurer of services, as well as um, a convener to be really laser focused on ensuring that we're moving forward in, in the fight for climate justice. So I'm proud that my team has put forward the first city level Green New Deal anywhere in the country. We lay out uh, 15, specific, 15 specific policy planks that would be immediately implementable by city government. Of course, some that are uh, kind of thought of in the traditional realm of, of climate activism, accelerating decarbonization deadlines, growing our tree canopy, really leaning into um, reducing emissions in a number of ways, but also emphasizing the workforce development opportunities we have to truly connect great local paying, high paying jobs with the opportunities and the needs for infrastructure improvements. Um, we want to also incorporate through our Green New Deal, housing justice and uh, racial equity and uh, commitment to small business or small business recovery that is equitable so that we are truly uh, including everyone in the shared prosperity of the city. And so, um, the last point I want to make, which is about um, what I believe is the, the sort of secret to, to how we should think about unlocking action on climate change, is how to bridge this sometimes tension between the short term and the long term, the um, here and now and so many other uh, ways that we are trying to, to um, provide services for families' lives, and sometimes what is discussed as a hundred year problem, right? We hear those phrases around uh, 100 year storm or 500 year storm, what, what is a chance that flooding occurs? Or um, we talk about the number of inches that the sea, sea levels will be higher in 70 years from now or 100 years from now. But the reality is that the connection point to all of this is to understand that climate change and everything we need to do is just as much about physical infrastructure as it is about social infrastructure. 
In other words, this is a people-centered problem. And this is a people-centered opportunity for the city of Boston and for municipalities and, and state and federal government everywhere to tackle. Um, our Green New Deal is focused on justice and focused on a set of principles that should guide not only our work when it comes to um, traditional climate and reducing emissions, but really to build the kind of social infrastructure that matters and that, that truly ensures prosperity and equity across the board. There have been now um, multiple important studies into the impact of major weather incidents or natural disasters. What happens and, and what is it about certain communities that enables uh, better survival rates or, or better resilience? And one of these studies looked into the heat wave that swept across Chicago in the mid 1990s. It was known that it would be coming and it was a sustained period of time with very, very high temperatures and many, many lives were lost in that period of time. And when uh, researchers really peeled back all the layers to understand exactly what happened across every community. And, and keep in mind, um, as someone who knows the area very well, uh, my parents first immigrated to this country from Taiwan and landed in Chicago. Uh, I, can, I can say uh, very confidently that there are many similarities between Chicago and Boston in that both of our cities um, love sports, love politics, but also have such a strong sense of neighborhood and community um, in, in, in each area, there's just, there are in some ways silos between communities or, or a very strong sense of identity, neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood. And so when, when the researchers went back and looked, it turns out that the neighborhoods or communities that had the highest survival rates didn't exactly line up with income level, right? It didn't exactly line up with the amount uh, that had been spent on physical infrastructure to prepare against this type of situation. In fact, the highest correlation between how well a specific neighborhood or community fared through this disaster was the social infrastructure, the degree to which residents felt connected to each other. And so that in this, for example, period of a heat wave, in some neighborhoods, even though the income levels were not um, at the top of the spectrum, residents still knew each other, were still calling and checking on their neighbors, figuring out who needed to be taken to a heating, a cooling center, or needed some shelter out of the sun, or, or just needed to be, um, you know, had some groceries delivered so they wouldn't have to go out in the heat. And that kind of social infrastructure, the connection between our communities, is, I believe, at the foundation of all of the challenges in policy that we're facing these days. The, the in some ways, dissolution of knowing our neighbors, of trusting our um, people who may think differently, worship differently, um, live differently, look differently than us, but who have a same stake in, in the same sense of place. And so I believe that city government is uniquely able to earn back and build back that kind of community. Um, I am a huge proponent of block parties as a way to save our democracy, um, but to also recognize that the design choices we make, the infrastructure investments we make, the, the community building that we invest in through the public sector directly has an impact on that social cohesion and resilience. And um, in fact, the, the underlying factor that matters most of all, building a connected city. Um, so from transit and food and schools and, and housing, every other way that we are um, pushing forward with for a Green New Deal and, and the steps to end uh, our climate crisis being the same steps to end poverty and to ensure um, equity. This is our charge that we can act on, that we can urgently um, bring people together for. And um, I'm really excited to dig into the conversation more. Um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But thank you so much for being part of this and for inviting me to join today. Thank you, Councillor Wu. Uh, we look forward to diving in more to all the things you just shared, um, but we'll give first Dr. Abu Hamid a chance to share some remarks and then we'll go to some questions. Okay, hi, good afternoon. It's uh, such an honor and pleasure to be with the with you today, especially to be a panelist with the Councillor Wu. This is a great uh, honor for me. As the Councillor Wu mentioned that uh, the global temperatures are rising, the rainfall rates are decreasing, especially in the, uh, in the Middle East. 
we are facing serious and extreme uh, weather conditions because of uh, climate change, which is actually the a most urgent a global challenge that we are uh, facing. At the Araba Institute for Environmental uh, Studies, we are addressing and mitigating the impact of uh, climate change through our academic uh, curriculum, our uh, joint research with our neighbors in Jordan, Palestine, and, uh, and Israel, and also through our public uh, outreach with, uh, with our partners. Uh, I would like actually to share a few slides with the, with you to give you some examples of the research that we do at the Arava Institute to combat climate uh, climate change. The Arava Institute is located in the Arava Valley, in the Negev Desert in uh, in Israel. It's like 30 miles north to the Gulf of uh, Ilat uh, or Aqaba. Our mission at the Arava Institute is to advance uh, cross-border environmental cooperation in the face of uh, political conflict. We do that to ensure that the shared environmental resources of our region will be protected from further degradation and, uh, and loss. Our scarce environmental resources, especially here in the Middle East, will no longer be a source of uh, conflict. Environmental cooperation in our region, we want that to be a model for uh, other regions around the around the world, this is a photo uh, taken by uh, by NASA by satellite in the year 2015. It's a sandstorm that covered the whole eastern Mediterranean from Cyprus to to Iraq, and it's just to show you that nature knows no borders. During this sandstorm, you can see some photos. The upper left one is from Jerusalem, the Jaffa Street. The right upper one is downtown Baghdad. And the photo in, uh, at the bottom is in, uh, in Lebanon. So the whole region faced this challenge before a few years. In this photo here, you see my, my village in East Jerusalem. This is the, the mosque, the tower of the, of the mosque. And if you look to the middle of the photo in the, in the horizon, you can see two towers. These two towers are downtown Amman. This photo actually shows you how small the region that we live we live in, and the region that we live in, we share most of the resources. When I say resources, that can be water, energy, and air, because we live in a very tiny region. The West Bank and Israel, we share the same mountain aquifer, the same water resources. Gaza shares with Israel the coastal aquifer. Jordan shares with Israel many rivers, especially the Jordan, the Jordan uh, River. And the regional climate change models predict a further increase in the frequency and duration of severe droughts as ongoing result of, uh, of the climate change. And we see this very clearly in, in our region. Sometimes we have heavy rain in one day, sometimes we pass the winter without any, any rain. The region that we live in, it has the highest percentage of transboundary rivers. The, the rivers that we have, uh, or the water resources, they provide about 60% of our, the fresh, our fresh water supply. And this is considered the highest rate of dependence on international basin in the, in the world. Both countries, Israel and Jordan, rely on fossil fuels for the electricity production. We rely on coal and natural gas. And these are highly polluting uh, fossil fuels. And all of, you, all, all of you know what happened in the year 2012 it's, uh, or 11. It's the, the Arab Spring. And during the Arab Spring, ISIS took over the Sinai Peninsula and they destroyed the gas pipeline that provides Jordan and Israel with the, with the natural gas that is necessary for the, for the power production. And because of uh, that disruption in the gas supply, Israel and Jordan had to switch from natural gas into oil for electricity, for electricity production. And as a result of that, we saw a significant increase in the carbon dioxide emissions in both, in both countries. Look here in the year 2012, significant increase in CO2 emissions in Israel, and the same thing also in, in Jordan. So the instability in such a small, important region doesn't only impact the political situation of the region, it also impacts the climate and the carbon dioxide emissions that are produced in the, in the region. 
So what do we do at the Araba Institute? One of the projects that we have is Track to Environmental Forum. It's a civil society, society a movement that brings different organizations from the, uh, the region to uh, increase uh, and to prepare the ground for the future environmental agreements between Israel, Palestine, and, and Jordan. Some examples that we conduct at uh, the Arab Institute is a five megawatt solar energy plant in, uh, in the Gaza Strip. Gaza actually faces a massive electricity shortage. People in Gaza receive two to like six hours of electricity every, every day. And this, uh, this project can partially help the people get enough amount of electricity for their daily uses and also to treat the waste water in the, in the Gaza Strip. Another project is the Watergen. Watergen is an Israeli company that produces devices that they generate water, drinking water from the, uh, from the air. And we know that in, in Gaza, almost 96% of the groundwater is, is polluted because of the penetration of untreated uh, sewage or wastewater to the aquifers and also to the Mediterranean. We managed to convince the uh, Israeli army to uh, provide Gaza with three machines that are used to generate drinking water. Uh, two machines are in uh, hospitals and one machine is in a school. Another project is off-grid wastewater treatment system. Wastewater treatment in Gaza is, is a major problem because of the shortage of electricity. They do not have enough electricity to treat the wastewater and because that it penetrates to the, to the aquifer. So this project will be off-grid, supplied with electricity using solar energy and will treat the wastewater and will produce a water that can be used for agricultural purposes. Another project, which is one of the most important projects that we have in the uh, Tractive Forum is the Young Professionals uh, Forum. It's a project that brings young professionals from Palestine, Israel, and the, uh, the, main, the main region. They are entrepreneurs, they are young professionals that they know their communities and know the needs of the, of the communities. We use the tool of environmental uh, diplomacy in, uh, in the region, we use the environment as a diplomacy tool, as a science diplomacy to bridge between, between people. We build a networks and we help them to start their a, environmental projects in the, in the region. To combat climate change, cooperation is, is very essential. And I want you to use the, the phrase that was used by the US General Secretary, no country can succeed alone. A regional cooperation is very essential to combat climate change in, uh, in our region. In our region, as, as you saw, we, uh, we have a water scarcity. We rely on, uh, on fossil fuels, but these problems can be solved. And the most scarce resource in the, in the Middle East is, is trust. Once you build trust between communities, between different organizations in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, the rest become very easy to solve and to uh, have a brighter future for the coming generations in our, in our region. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you both um, for sharing so much about, you know, what, what work you're both doing and what some of the challenges you're facing are. And it's definitely interesting to hear some of the common challenges that you both experience. I think particularly around coalition building, consensus building, and really um, bringing together the right people, you know, to, to address this issue. So maybe we could just start there, you know, and, and of course, the challenge of bringing together people across different countries, you know, and, and certainly is a little bit different than some of the things that we face in Boston, but we actually already got a question from the audience about how are, how are cities working together, even within the state of Massachusetts. So maybe let's just start on the topic of coalition building. You know, what does that look like for each of you? How are you bringing stakeholders together and what are some of the things you've learned in that process? Maybe we can start with uh, Councillor Wu. This is the, um, this, this is the most important part of, of any uh, type of policy making. And I would say, you know, in my eight years on the council, I have learned that it's not only to sort of maximize the chance of 
actually getting something done or passed or or through and and to build the kind of public pressure for that action to be taken inside government but it's also to ensure that it actually delivers impact and that the results that um, we sometimes anticipate or hope for when drafting a piece of legislation or or building out a program will never actually match up unless one, it has come from the lived experiences of, of people on the ground and, and our residents who, who have solutions, um, but also that, that community has been involved in the process of bringing about this change to then champion continuing it and, and um, deepening and, and carrying it on. And so I think, you know, sometimes um, we're, we're in, a, in a city like Boston where for example, there is, there is uh, you know, everybody identifies as a Democrat on the Boston City Council, right? So we're, in terms of just pure political affiliation or, or ideology, Boston is perceived to be much more um, progressive or, or left-leaning. But the, the, the challenge, of, particularly when it comes to big, big changes, such as the, the scale that we need to see for climate change, um, there is always the decision of when and how to and how much to deviate from the status quo to bring about something else. And it always, you know, of course, there are folks who are uh, benefiting from or only know the status quo. And, and that I think is often the biggest shift of needing to build a coalition to truly bring together all perspectives on, on what the um, impacts intended and unintended might be from a policy and to lean in. Um, so when, whenever we have taken on issues at the city level, I believe uh, we've been able to do some previously thought impossible um, changes such as implementing citywide uh, what's called community choice energy, municipal aggregation, negotiating a, a new default electricity contract on behalf of all residents and small businesses seamlessly uh, with a higher sourcing of renewable energy. We were told this would be impossible to do right when we started four years ago that a city of Boston size, it would just be too disruptive, too much, uh, too complicated. But building that coalition, right, having some of the utilities companies at the table, having residents from all communities, ensuring that we were we were seeing this as a, a two way dialogue of not just tell us how to um, implement this, but what would this mean for the community and what questions would people have to to feel comfortable and, and kind of keep spreading the word in the community. This is key and, and again goes back to why I believe the social infrastructure and building community not around reacting to specific incidents or crises, but building that community to be durable for the long term and proactively is most important. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abu Hamid. Well, here, here in the in the Middle East, especially with the political instability and the tension between between countries, building coalition is not. A, it's not an easy mission. The Rabbi Institute is almost 25 years old and uh, we managed to convince our partners in, uh, in Palestine and also in, uh, in Jordan that the agenda of the Rabbi Institute is the shared environment. Israel is a developed country, Palestine is Jordan are developing countries. Uh, and when you approach a partner in, uh, in Palestine or in, uh, in Jordan, we approach them on the concept of a mutual benefit. We share the same environment. We share a, the same resources. Protecting our environment from further degradation is, is a benefit uh, for all of us for the coming uh, generations. We uh, managed to build a trust with the, with the partners, uh, help them <coughs> to develop the, the right technologies uh, to improve their, their lives. This is the most important element uh, for someone who lives in a, a developing country, because the only thing that they care of is how to bring or uh, the, the next meal for their, uh, for their families. So using the uh, technologies that are developed in, uh, in Israel, to these uh, communities, uh, rural communities in, in Palestine, in Jordan, and sometimes in the, in the Negev desert, and to improve their, uh, their lives uh, with the goal of uh, protecting the, uh, the environment, 
helped us uh, very much to build this trust and to widen this, uh, this coalition. Great, thank you so much. I think we're, we're getting some quite technical questions on the chat. So I, th I think we may not get to cover the technical questions during this conversation, but um, perhaps we can follow up with each of our speakers and sort of produce a list of answers so that we don't um, we don't get too technical here. But um, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, you know, so in, in hierarchy of needs, right, where we have such a pressing challenge, what are some of the most immediate next steps for each of you, you know, in, around this issue so that we have a sense of how you're prioritizing what needs to happen? Councillor Wu, if you'd like to start. Um, I believe there are um, a couple layers that, that we need to think through. One is just in general to, to really make this tangible for each community. And so I think, again, when we talk about sea level rise and we're often looking at the year 2070 or 2100 as a planning tool, um, it can get disconnected from, as, as you're saying, the hierarchy of needs that, that every parent or, or um, caregiver or, or family member is, is facing in that day. And so it is both about building the community infrastructure to, to talk about climate issues in a way that connects directly with housing and stability and food access and education um, as it is or organizing around the immediate crises, right? So there are there are examples in in each community. In in um, East Boston, we have been fighting an electrical substation, which would be an, an environmental hazard in already a community that has been disproportionately um, burdened with so many um, uh, large uh, uh, population uh, you know, environmental justice community. Um, in Chinatown and in communities of color across the, the city and state, we know the exposure to air pollution is disproportionately high. Um, and in so many of our neighborhoods right along the water, the flooding is more than inconvenience. It is um, exacerbating unsafe or unhealthy living conditions in many cases. It is uh, restricting transportation and mobility to jobs and, and uh, medical appointments. And so um, I think the most important is that in this moment of recovery from the pandemic, the flood of resources that we will receive both to deal with the public health crisis and economic crisis, as well as I believe we will, we will see federal resources for the climate crisis um, in, in the near term, that these have to be distributed equitably and in a way that doesn't just put band-aids on situations, but connects to the, that underlying long-term um, community building and, and change. Great. Okay, I, I believe that the, the most pressing uh, climate change issue will be our uh, capacity to provide the uh, adequate food and water to every person in, uh, in our region. Uh, this is a challenge we are already uh, struggling with and the uh, climate change will increasingly cause uh, drought and the uh, extreme weather events as we see in, uh, in our region. Both our water uh, sources and uh, agriculture production are very sensitive to uh, these climate uh, shifts the potential future of uh, food and the uh, water shortages will uh, lead, and actually it's, it's leading today to increased uh, global unrest and uh, political tensions, as we see in, uh, in Egypt and also as we are seeing in, uh, in Syria. So providing the, the people with the let's say, adequate amount of uh, food and, uh, and water and our capacity to uh, to do that, I think this is the most pressing climate change issue. 
Thank you. Now that you've, you know, one of the, the joys of bringing you both together is, you know, to learn from both of your experiences, but I'd also like to give you a chance to ask each other questions or to kind of dig in more on what each other has said, you know, so just based on what you've heard from each other so far, is there any, is there any follow up? Are there any questions that you've been thinking about that may benefit, you know, what the work you're doing in your own respective areas? I, I will start. I I I have so enjoyed um, Dr. Abu Hamid's presentation. Um, one piece that I have been thinking about anyway for the city that um, really stuck out um, that I would love your your expertise and insight on is around the uh, wastewater and um, management of and efficiency of that. You know, Boston is in some ways surrounded uh, by water, but because again the the unique way that our um, landfill and, and historic sort of construction of the city's landmass happened, much of the city is on landfill, which requires recharge of the groundwater system. And so we've had some conversations about these issues. There's an opportunity to really do a lot more. Um, would love if you had advice on first steps, next steps, both on the actual infrastructure building and how to think about what technologies, but also the funding of it, right? When it's an issue that affects so many people, um, you know, how, how does the financing work? Look, actually, most of the most of our uh, projects are uh, funded by uh, international uh, organizations, and it's uh, what uh, convince uh, these organizations to fund these projects is actually the the shared society building. When I say shared society, it's not within one one city. It's within a within a region, and the the diplomacy tool that is used through these uh, these projects, you you are not only uh, benefiting the the community, you are benefiting the whole uh, the whole region. You are building bridges through these environmental uh, environmental projects, and when it comes to collaboration with a developed country or developed city like uh, like Boston. Actually, this becomes more attractive to uh, to donors, especially uh, benefiting from the uh, high tech or the knowledge in uh, in Boston, and to transfer the the knowledge from a developed region or, or from to a developing uh, region. Uh, landfills is a is a major problem also in uh, in our region in Palestine and also in in Israel and also in uh, in Jordan, not only uh, for the for the buildings or for expanding the uh, the cities. Here we face it in uh, actually collecting the the natural gas or the landfill gas uh, that you have to uh, to collect to prevent. Uh, future disasters from the accumulation of the uh, uh, of the gas, and uh, I'll be happy to share more information on, on these projects with uh, with you. It will be my pleasure. Thank you. Great. And Dr. Abu Khaman, I'll, I'll give you a chance um, if there's any questions you have about what the City of Boston is doing or any places that you'd like to learn more about. Yeah, actually. Uh, uh, Councillor Wu mentioned the extreme weather conditions and the heat waves in uh, in, uh, in Boston. Here, actually, we 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 face that we have uh, very high uh, heat waves and also cold waves that we are not prepared uh, not prepared for. Uh, I know Boston; it's a very diverse uh, city, and I would like to know how like the, this different culture works to, together when you face such uh, an impact of, uh, of the climate change on, on heat waves? Well, I think, I mean, the reality is we're still in the middle of, of all of those changes. And we do, I, I believe the city um, does as much as possible to try to communicate to residents. So again, thinking about the infrastructure that exists outside of crisis times is really important to already have multilingual um, 
uh, messaging set up, as many residents as possible connected to a uh, text messaging system to get major alerts when there might be an unexpected situation or, or some, some news that, that should go out citywide, um, as well as uh, there's a program in the city hall called the Greenovate program, which is meant to really be a community facing side to the, the environment department to build uh, leadership teams and, and uh, communications channels throughout each different community geographically and, and by other communities. And so a lot of it, I believe, is making sure that there's as much that goes out ahead of time to, so that people know what to do, that it is coming, that there are cooling centers available which get opened up publicly. This has been very tricky during the pandemic um, to think about how to administer that. And, and luckily there wasn't that much um, heat over, over this, this last summer, but there were a couple instances where it did need to be deployed um, and then finding ways just to um, address the mobility challenges as well that many of the residents who may most need um, to access these cooling centers or, or get extra support might be homebound seniors or those living on their own. How do we think about actually connecting people physically, getting people to these locations or um, army, you know, providing the funding ahead of time so that residents can improve their homes and get access to low cost or no cost loans to be able to um, make sure that there's heat, adequate heating ventilation systems already installed in, in their own homes as well. Thank you. So we're seeing another a number of questions specifically about coalition building. And I think people would benefit from hearing maybe a specific example, you know, that you had to work through where there was a lot of complexity around who the stakeholders are. And, and to the point that has been made, a lot of the people who are most impacted are the most vulnerable with the least maybe power or voice in the conversation. So I know that you mentioned the compressor station, um, which, you know, is something that um, has been a, a big challenge for parts of Boston. Could you just talk us, you know, maybe in a little bit more specific detail about what it looks like to build a coalition to address that issue? What are the types of groups that you need to include? And beyond just building trust, what are some of the next steps, you know, there to ensure that the, the, the city of Boston get, gets the outcomes it's looking for? And I, I feel um, almost silly going first on this question, knowing that Dr. Abu Hamid deals with international diplomacy. So I'll start with a very, very micro neighborhood level, and then I hope we can zoom out to the, the, the difficult stuff. Um, I think I'll give an example because the, the, the station, the substation is one where it's just been such an awful um, series of events where there's an additional layer of that is that the actual decision makers are disconnected from the city. And so we have both in terms of this type of infrastructure as well as um, gas pipeline infrastructure, which is regulated by the Federal, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, which depending on which political administrations appointed which appointees, it has been complicated their relationship with the oil and gas industry. And so we've had many instances where there's been nearly unanimous um, opposition from local and state elected officials and community leaders. And yet, because the decision-making point actually was elsewhere, um, it, it's been ext extremely frustrating. I'll, <clears throat> I'll give an example where we saw success um, unexpectedly, or, or I guess to counter expectations um, in building and, and passing our wetlands protection ordinance. This was the single biggest step that the city of Boston could have taken to require resilient development in our city. We had gone from a, a regulatory framework, which was largely built around a voluntary resiliency checklist, which would be negotiated with each um, large scale developer. And um, the idea was that this, you know, the, the justification for that system was that it would provide more flexibility and rather than regulating a specific technology, which might be out of date later on, um, we would run through a checklist and get to the maximum possible on each one. Well, there ended up just not being consistency across the board on what the baselines were, and particularly when it comes to um, valuable natural resources, which guard against, you know, can absorb flooding, which um, absorb heat, which are um, irreplaceable in, in some ways. The parcel by parcel look at it, one negotiation by another, it always would go in the favor of, well, you know, we will do this. And, and in this one instance, it's okay to lose this amount of, of green space. So we really needed a wider framework to look at it comprehensively. 
And this was a coalition that came together. Um, the technical name of the ordinance is around wetlands, but we made sure to use the legal uh, space within the law to apply the largest definition of that. So um, any natural resource areas bring together, of course, those neighborhoods with specific wetlands in them, but also coastal neighborhoods, also uh, parts of the city such as the Arnold Arboretum, where there's just a large swath of open space that would be impacted by encroaching development. And so we really thought about geographic representation. We thought about income representation, wanting to make sure that working class communities were included and in the coalition, multilingual communities, and that um, there would be a regular mechanism inside to just keep the progress going. So once there was a structural commitment to say, there's gonna be a, a monthly meeting with the coalition to do this, then there was more of a sense of, okay, we're gonna come back, we're gonna keep pushing in the face of so much opposition just to keep moving forward, just to try another angle. In fact, that coalition has gone on to take on other challenges as well after this legislation has passed, just to show the durability and the importance of um, community building to last beyond the, the individual issue. So, you know, it's bringing the right people together and then setting them up to succeed and sort of creating accountability structure and, and a schedule and, you know, a timeline around which you're going to deliver and, and sort of to continue to meet those milestones. So that that's very instructive for us. Thank you. And Dr. Abu Hamid, maybe an example, you know, of, of a specific time where you've had to build a challenging coalition and what were the steps that you took? Okay, so I'll give you an example of a, of a coalition that we managed to establish with the with the Gaza Strip. A, this is a tough, a, a tough region in Gaza. A, it's a city with a, 2 million people, almost 70% of them under the age of, uh, of 30. Gaza is under the control of, uh, of Hamas. So uh, even a contact with, the, with Hamas is, uh, is forbidden and it's, uh, it's really hard. They don't accept uh, any kind of cooperation with any Israeli organization, even with environmental uh, organizations. I, I mentioned the the challenge of uh, of electricity. Lack of electricity in Gaza prevents the Gaza municipality or the Gaza government to treat the wastewater. Untreated wastewater is penetrating to the uh, the aquifer, the shared aquifer, and also a. Uh, the wastewater treatment plants, they just dump the wastewater into the Mediterranean. 96% of the water in Gaza is polluted. Uh, almost 100% of the beaches in Gaza are polluted. The water uh, stream in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean is south north. So the waste is transferred to, uh, to Israel, to Ashkelon, which is a city neighboring to, to the Gaza Strip. And Ashkelon is a house uh, for the world's largest desalination plant. When the seawater is, uh, is polluted, that impacts the desalination plant. So now we have, we have a mutual interest. We have an environmental problem uh, that has a transboundary aspect. Lack of electricity in Gaza, untreated wastewater, polluted seawater, and millions of dollars are lost because the desalination plant is not functioning in the in uh, in Ashkelon. So we approached the the Israeli army, and we said that we are planning to build a five megawatt uh, solar plant to uh, have a, a major portion of that to treat the untreated uh, wastewater. And uh, for the, the Gazans, this will solve uh, an environmental issue and will also generate electricity for the people and will generate water to, uh, that can be used for, uh, for irrigation. So this mutual uh, interest was the key to build such a, such a coalition. We have a partner organization in the, uh, in the West Bank. So they established the contact with the with the head of the municipalities in uh, in Gaza, and we at the Arab Institute established the connection with the with the Israeli army. So we had three organizations working in uh, in different countries to establish one uh, one project, and because we we managed to build trust with this Palestinian organization, that uh, co the, to build that coalition was uh, I, I can say it was easy uh, easy mission. 
that took us almost two years, but uh, we managed to do that. Yeah, the time horizon for these, this coalition building, you know, can be long, especially in the face of the urgency of the problem, but at the same time, laying that foundation feels like it was material for you to make the progress that you did. Indeed. Abu Hamad, it took us two years too to build ours, so yours was very fast at that scale. <laughs> So we're, we're coming to the end. So as so I wanna offer you both a chance to give some closing thoughts, but I'd love in those close, closing thoughts, if you could talk a little bit about how can the people who came here today who are clearly interested in this issue and are invested in both um, addressing climate change in Boston and in Israel, how can they, what, what further actions can they take at the individual level to be a stakeholder in this issue? And then also what are some of the things that we think our cities, you know, that, Boston and Israel can do together um, going forward to really address this issue. Um, so if you could include those in your closing thoughts, that would be great. Councilor? Uh, well, well, first, I'm just, uh, again, it's been such a, a joy and a, an honor to be part of this conversation. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Samantha, thank you, Dr. Abu Hamed, for all of your insights. I look forward to following up on some of the, the technical, um, receiving that wisdom. I, I would say for, for anyone who's part of this, who wants to stay involved, uh, there, please reach out. <laughs> I'll make sure I put my contact information in the chat, first of all. Um, but also know that there are so many organizations doing this work on the ground now who could really use your support. Um, I, and I would really look into organizations, um, I think some that particularly have impact and could use support are those that focus on the intersection between climate justice and, and equity and racial equity as, as their, their primary drive. And so it's organizations like ACE, Alternatives for Community Environment, like Green Roots, um, which really focuses and spans the, the Chelsea, East Boston area, but all, all, all throughout the city on many of the issues we've discussed, Sunrise, um, is another organizing and local coalition that is doing incredible work and offers a regular forum to get involved. And then outside of um, either financially supporting or getting involved with those organizations, think about ways to plug into the policy conversations that are happening as well. It's, I think some folks might be surprised just how low the threshold is in terms of a number of emails that an elected official has to get to really trigger a strong sense that I should do something about this. Um, and so the game of politics is to try to get the greatest number of people to agree to push for the fewest number of things together. Um, and you can build that coalition by adding things to that list. But if you have a particular issue as small as um, a neighborhood uh, empty parcel that could be turned into a park or as large as trying to move forward with legislation to, um, uh, to, to transition away from fossil fuel infrastructure altogether at the state level, there are um, ways to plug in with your local or state elected officials to move that forward. And I'm always happy to help brainstorm on those issues, but um, now is the time with a closing window of, of urgency that we all have to be doing whatever we can. And um, of course, we wanna each take whatever individual steps we can, but I am always of the philosophy that it is not the right approach to put this burden on individuals that if we just recycle a little bit more or you know save water a little bit more we want to do everything we can but the larger responsibility is on the public sector on our um, governmental policy makers to take that system-wide change and so we could really use everyone plugging in to, to keep the urgency going on that thank you uh... It was really great pleasure to uh, to be with you. Uh, I would like to thank the GCRC in uh, in Boston, uh, Samantha, Emily, for this uh, important uh, event. Uh, I gave you like very small uh, sample of the of the projects that we do at the Arava Institute. And if you would like to hear more about the Arava Institute and the projects that we conduct, actually our friends of the Arava uh, offices in Boston. So you can just search that, uh, friends of the, of the Arava Institute, and I'm sure they will be more than happy to provide you with more, with more uh, information. Look, when it comes to, uh, to policy, uh, to, the public, uh, to the public sector, even in, uh, in our region, in a region that has uh, uh, countries that are uh, developing, to convince 
policymakers uh, to pay attention to, to climate change is, is a challenge. Uh, but we don't have the, the luxury to, uh, to give up. We have to uh, act locally and to think uh, globally. The climate change impact, uh, we are facing it uh, today. It impacts every aspect of our daily, uh, daily lives. And that's what we do at the, at the Arava Institute. We bring uh, Palestinian, Jordanian, international, Israeli students, and we prepare uh, the future environmental leaders of, uh, of our region. So it's a uh, step by step, I think we can reach the, the final goal. Okay. Well, and, I... and before, before I forget, I would like to wish you all a uh, Moadim La Simcha and Chag Sameach. Thank you so much. And I know JCRC looks forward to being a partner to both of you in this important work. And so we're gonna put just a few links in the chat before we go. Um, one is to learn more about JCRC's Israel work, including our Boston Partners for Peace initiative. And so that'll be in the chat shortly. And also to learn about our, about our advocacy work um, across the board and on many of the things that we're doing with the state and the city of Boston. Um, and the final thing is I just wanna invite all of you to join us for our annual Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Program on Sunday, April 11th. Um, there'll be in the, a link in the chat to register. Um, this will be a virtual program this year. And um, you know it's a very meaningful time of the year to commemorate the Holocaust and to come together as a community. Uh, so we hope to see many of you there. And thank you so much to Councillor Wu and to Dr. Abu Hamid for joining us for this really important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.